If you missed the fifth class, today we learn about some major Supreme Court cases. And as you can see here, there are three rectangles. So please begin with this one. And I started class asking a fairly simple question. What do you all know about the Supreme Court? And it ranged from a ton to nothing and people who are in between. So let me share with you some of the answers that your classmates came up with in class. Very first answer, there's nine of them. Why is there nine of them? To avoid ties. I think most people knew that. Majority of people knew, once you're a Supreme Court justice, you're in there for life. Few people knew that they were appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Now, those same few people knew the power of judicial review. Safe argument, the most powerful tool the Supreme Court has. And here's what it is. It's a big process to make a law. House and Senate and committees and hearings and you know, president has to sign it. It's a production. The Supreme Court, those nine people could look at that law and say, nope, it's not constitutional. Boom, done, over. That is a very, very powerful tool. On a lighter note, most everybody knew they are in Washington, D.C., along with the rest of our federal government. They only hear a small percentage of cases, only one to two percent. A few people knew they only dealt with cases of constitutional interpretation. Some people said they're really powerful and they're supposed to be non-political. However, in recent years, has that been a little bit different? I'm going to let you figure that one out for yourself. Kind of a controversial topic. But these things are the basics of the Supreme Court, and I hope you've learned about them in a prior class. If not, there you go. Okay, so that was the what do you know. Now, this assignment sheet relates to the Supreme Court cases, which I'm going to briefly take you through. Now, I do want to share with you, I do use this PowerPoint for my AP government class. Um, there's a lot of details and bullet points. For our purposes, I only need you to know the major precedent, what a precedent is, and why these are important. Okay, so I'm going to simplify it here for our purposes. And the very first case is Marbury versus Madison. And you're noticing at the end of every Supreme Court case, you put in parentheses the year. So just make that a general practice for this class, government class, civics class. So Marbury versus Madison, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, maybe the most important one, because that laid the groundwork for building this country. It ended, not ended, it lessened the squabbling between the state level and the federal level. You probably recall from government that very tense debate between Federalists and Anti-Federalists. So in a sense, the Federalists won, if you think about this, because having the federal level being the main, not the main, the supreme law of the land, excuse me, that's a Federalist idea. Okay, so Marbury versus Madison, Constitution, supreme law of the land. Now, the second case <clears throat> is McCulloch versus Maryland, 1819. A little more complicated. A couple things, good things that came from this. We have one currency, not a state currency for all 50 states. Imagine having to change your currency if you went to Toledo. That would be crazy. Also, it said that um, the federal government is going to take priority over the state government. And it also set up our financial, our federal financial system in a way that was practical and we could raise money and grow a country. So that was McCulloch versus Maryland. Now, the third case is Plessy versus Ferguson. This began an era, not the most pleasant era of U.S. history, called Jim Crow from 1896 to 1954. And it allowed legally segregation under the premise of separate but equal. But even, even if you have a rudimentary knowledge of U.S. history, you know it wasn't equal. And I think you're recalling those pictures from your history book, black drinking fountain, white drinking fountain, black theater, white theater. So this began the era of segregation that ended with this Supreme Court case, Brown versus Board of Education, 1954. Now, on a practical level, we have a very diverse school we go to. But if a black student and a white student are sitting next to each other, it's because of this. Ending Jim Crow 
ushering in the era of integration. Now, it didn't magically overnight turn happy, happy. You remember in history class, the civil rights movement in the 60s and all the fights to get the Voting Rights Acts and that kind of thing. However, it ends segregation, begins integration. So that's Brown versus Board. That's the one the most people knew about in class. I'm guessing you knew that one too. Okay, now this one, very few of anybody knew. Gideon versus Wainwright. Now, this is an important one because uh, Gideon had to go through the legal process without attorneys. And it's very difficult to know the law. And he actually wrote on pencil and paper a petition to have his case heard, and it was heard. And the outcome of this is that even if you're destitute, completely poor, in poverty, everyone gets an attorney to represent them. So it really fattened up, reinforced, buttressed that Fifth Amendment due process. So that's an important case in that respect. Now, Miranda versus Arizona, most people could fill that in. Um, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Just about everybody knew that. I think it's pretty ubiquitous. It surrounds us. But the origin of this comes from a man named Ernesto Miranda. Not a nice guy. Not a great guy. And um, he didn't understand his rights. And um, that was problematic. And he won. This very evil guy won um, the case. So from this, we make sure anybody who is apprehended by the police have their rights read to them. And again, this is a good reinforcement of civil rights for everyone. Civil rights, civitas, meaning all the citizens, everyone, civil rights. Okay. Now, the other case, this is a case that other people knew quite a bit, uh, Roe versus Wade. Now, Roe Ro versus Wade in 1973 allowed for women the option to get abortions at a federal level. Now, there were some states that did allow it, but it was a federal sort of thing. Now, recently, I am making this PowerPoint in 2024. Uh, recently, it switched. Now it's back to the states. And you can look at our 50 states. It's almost pre-1973, where some states, um, abortions are fairly accessible. Some states, they're pretty much, you're not going to get one. And if you do try to get one in another state, there's going to be sanctions against you, against you. So there's a wide range right now. We'll see what the future holds, right? And then the last case, U.S. versus Nixon. And I hope you recall in history, Watergate, Richard Nixon broke the law. And I think this reinforces rule of law better than anything. Even if you are the president, you did wrong and you can't do that. So, you know, claiming I'm the president, I have executive privilege. Um, you can't do that. No, if we're going to be buying into rule of law as a country, that applies to everyone, even the president. Okay. So uh, hopefully you already knew these. If not, um, here's some new information for you. So um, to exit, please know the basic facts of the Supreme Court and know the precedents that were set in those eight cases. And if you know those things, you'll be keeping up with everybody else in class, and I look forward to seeing you when you get back. So appreciate you watching.